A good afternoon, and welcome to the service for Margaret Mangan. My name is Paul Cochran, and I, was the, I have the privilege of being here on behalf of my family. My father was Keith Cochran, and my grandmother was Agnes Cochran, and Agnes was aunt to Margaret, and so the family tree grows mightily <laughs> amongst the Mangans and the Cochrans and many others. Uh, I've tried in the past to uh, kind of keep this in my head, but I think I'm going to have to put it down on paper. There are uh, Mangans and Cochrans. Uh, I believe Mary Mangan is uh, the family genealogy, genealogist on that side, and Jim Cochran has uh, traced the, both Margaret, or the Mangans and the Cochrans quite a ways back as well. But our service this afternoon is a service of scripture and song, song that we will listen to, and then of words of eulogy, good words to remember Margaret by, to commend her to God, to honor her faith, faith that she lived very deeply, and to rejoice that she left us a gift, a gift of herself, a gift of life, a gift of hope. So I'd like to open with a prayer. God of endless ages, from one generation to the next generation, you have been our refuge, our strength. You have been our rock of safety. Before the mountains were born or the earth came to be, you are God. 
Have mercy now on your servant Margaret, whose long life was spent in your service and service to your people. Give her a place in your kingdom where hope is firm for all who love and rest is sure for all who serve. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd now like to invite uh, her nephew Tom to come forward. Good afternoon and thank you very much for coming. This is uh, not the best weather and certainly not the best of conditions for getting out. And so coming to a public gathering is greatly appreciated during this time. Um, as such, of course, we have to wear masks, but while you're up here at the podium, if you want to speak during the eulogies, it's okay to remove your mask as long as we're behind this screen. Um, please bear in mind we've got people that are watching remotely on a live stream, and this service is being recorded for viewing later, and we'll have that available um, probably tomorrow. And so if you don't have that link, let me know and uh, give me an email address and I'll get that to you. Um, we'll have, as I say, some different people that want their voices to be heard as they recognize and remember the role that Margaret played in their lives. And so bear with me as I speak on their behalf as they were not able to attend today. So again, thank you for coming. This reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Jesus told his disciples, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. And so as we reflect on Margaret's life, we know that she served, just as Jesus called all of his disciples to serve, not just out of duty, but out of love, loyalty, joy, even when it was most difficult. So let's keep that in mind as we honor Margaret this afternoon. The amount of service that she gave and that she called others to do the same. So before I forget, um, we do have the internment service at Willamette National Cemetery, and that starts promptly at 2 p.m., and of course that's on military time. So we need to be leaving here at 
um, in order to be in position over there. And so we'll gather together at that uh, gate of the cemetery and then we'll be escorted to one of the shelters um, for the burial ceremony there, if you're going to be attending. Margaret, Margie, Ms. Mangan, Colonel Mangan. We saw this giving, amazing person in different ways. Several voices today will share the sides that they witnessed so we may better appreciate the entirety of her. You may have heard the expression, leather and lace. Well, that's not quite how I saw her from my perspective. Aunt Margie was more iron and baking dough. There was always a large iron skillet within reach of her stove while something delicious was baking in the oven. For many years, I was a fortunate recipient of dozens of Mac Power Muffins from a recipe from the Multnomah Athletic Club that uh, she put together just for me because she knew that I liked things that were tasty from her kitchen, but also nutrition, and she mixed in a healthy dose of loving as well. The baking dough and iron skillet image also reminds me of the many family holidays gathered around her large dining room table where an endless number of platters, bowls, and dishes awaited us with more on the stove and side tables. And if you had a second helping but refused a third, you would see her with a serving spoon in one hand a bowl in the other hand and a deadpan expression on her face as she'd say, you don't like my cooking. <laughs> and then of course with a smile, uh, she'd laugh it off because it meant mission accomplished. You were full. And many people can recall how Margie's eyes would twinkle with mirth when she was having fun. The iron side of her also represents her rigidity about what was right. Even at five foot nothing and a half, when Margie stood up for what she saw as right, those laughing Irish eyes could look like the business end of a couple of bullets. She was not one to back way easily, and she could stare down another officer, a doctor, someone bigger and taller, or a lazy teen teenager. <clears throat> There's an element of Margie that needs to be remembered. She truly cared about people. A few years ago, Margie confided in me how much it impacted her to medevac troops wounded in combat. Her heart reached out to the young patients in her care with grievous wounds. Those Irish eyes glistened with tears as she spoke of one young soldier that told her she reminded him of her mother, of his mother. He didn't complete that flight. Now, mission here accomplished. Margie has departed on her last flight to be always remembered by us. I'll always imagine her standing beside a huge heaping table in heaven, serving spoon in hand, telling St. Peter, you don't like my cooking. <laughs> Via con Dios, Margie. Say something. Come on, I have to put this down. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> so, as a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist and representing our sisters today, I'd like to speak as to how we came to know Margaret 
and love her dearly. First Margaret came, we came to, uh, she came to know us really uh, when she helped out at events at Bridal Veil where our convent is. As a good cook, as Margaret was, she would come and peel apple after apple, <laughs> peel potatoes and other sundry chores, working tirelessly alongside our sister Margaret Baim and sister Mary Michael Costello, who had founded our center, to help them pre prepare the meals for events that we were having then. And Margaret baked or helped to bake countless, countless apple pies, as you just heard. She loved to be around the kitchen and she was very attracted to coming to help us sisters. Always good natured and always dedicated. She and Sister Margaret had, a, had meaningful conversations together about faith and life that brought her very close to our community. Who would have thought a former lieutenant colonel in the military would have volunteered for KP service week after week? And as you have heard and know, Margaret was a very staunch Catholic, devoted to the Holy Rosary Parish, the Holy Rosary Church, doing charitable works. She regularly helped with their finance, their finances, counting their, their collections and so forth, in the gift shop, especially with the ongoing work of repairing rosaries. Margaret delivered also endless bags of groceries in her charitable efforts too, and we were the recipients of many of these. So much delicious food that Margaret picked out herself and delivered personally month after month. We would see the car coming up that, oh my goodness, <laughs> where she ever managed to have the time and to get all of those things, we didn't know. And she would find out what the sisters liked, each sister, and she made sure to include those items. It seemed like her generosity knew no bounds. She would even remember our birthdays. Somehow and stealthily she found out and she'd send us cards and remembrances of masses for each sister. She never expected anything in return, not to mention the very generous monetary donations she would make annually to us. And Margaret loved animals. That was a beloved Franciscan trait of hers, besides her dedication to the Dominicans. Once she brought us kittens, kittens to be good mousers in our barn, and she outfitted them, complete with scratching posts and kitty treats, and even a kitty music CD <laughs> to keep them calm, just in case. After listening to this pleasant music, I decided one time to play it during my Friday art sessions with, with our children in the classroom at our Montessori school. And I'd ask them, ask the children, do you want to hear the kitty music today? And then they would respond happily, oh yes, please, please, can we have that again? And then I'd tell them the story of how I got that particular CD. One day, also, Margaret appeared at our front door with a little purebred French poodle. Um, an elderly friend of hers could not keep it anymore after she had a serious fall, so she then rang the doorbell and uh, Sister Margaret, who was her very good friend, uh, had lost her puppy, who had been a kind of a poodle mix, and so we decided to call her Rachel after Rachel the first. And Rachel was the sweetest, most good-natured dog, and she loved by all of the sisters and ever faithful to Sister Margaret. And 
then afterwards to me when Sister Margaret wasn't able to care for her anymore. When Margaret came to visit us, Rachel would leap up, jump on her lap, lick her cheeks lovingly, and she knew. She knew the wonderful guardian who had found her a new home and a new family. Margaret would care for her when the sisters went back, when we went back to the mother house on retreats during the summers. We joked that Rachel was going to her summer townhouse, not only to be with Margaret, but to play with her little cat, Archie, Margaret's little love. Remembering Margaret, we remember her endless generosity, her faith, her love, and her joy. We will miss our dear friend, a heroic woman, charitable to the core, whom the angels are greeting and leading her happily to the Lord, her ultimate love.
as I mentioned earlier, there are some people that are not able to join us today, and they have asked that uh, their stories of Margaret be read on their behalf. And this will give us additional perspective into who she has been and what she has meant to different people. And so I'm, I was really thrilled to have contact with a, a close, close friend of hers from the 1940s. Um, and so I will now read the words written by Jean K. Word Berg, uh, who lives in Seattle. I first met Margaret in about 1947. I liked her immediately and grew to love her as a dear friend in the days that followed. We were both enrolled at the University of Washington School of Nursing. We were learning to make tight beds with or without patients in the bed. We were part of the class Basic 33s. Now, I wasn't around in the 40s, and so I had to do a little bit of research to find out what Jean meant by this. And the University of Washington School of Nursing numbered, or actually started with uh, an alphabetical listing for each of the classes that they had. And then when they reached the end of the alphabet, instead of starting over, they would um, go to a numbering system. So they were the class of the basic 33s. We lived in the nurse's home called Harborview Hall, sometimes jokingly called the Hen House. It was across the street from the hospital. We had class assignments during the day, mingled with ward duty assignments as well, sometimes all night on call duty for labors and deliveries. We graduated in 1949. At that time, Margaret and I moved to a small apartment on Beacon Hill. She was a very congenial roommate, never a crossword in nearly a year we lived together. With my first paycheck, I bought a phonograph and records of some of the Broadway hit musicals. We had little else, but we had music and laughs and good times. I can remember playing Kiss Me Kate, over and over until we nearly wore out the record. Although we attended different churches, we agreed on most items of faith. I admired her consistent faith and support of her church. She was maid of honor at my wedding in 1950. Through the years, our class met at least once a year, usually more often. In 1984, we all went to Hawaii to celebrate our 35th anniversary of graduation. We had a great time talking over and reliving old times. I will miss Margaret. By now, she has heard our Savior say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I look forward to seeing her again in the presence of our Savior, and in the day of peace and rest. Goodbye for now, dear friend. Uh, Ted, come on up. I was recommended to write some things down. So at first, um, my name is Ted uh, Vogel Pohl. It's a little shaky. I want to thank you, Tom, for being able to uh, set this up for a live feed because I know my brother is watching. Um, hi, Tom. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, take me a minute. So I have a trigger. I figured it out. It started in 2003. It's 
coming. Just takes a minute. It's when my dad passed away. Margaret and my dad were close. So I'm 61. I probably remember maybe when I was 10, more, more of Margaret. So I mean, I've had her in my life for over 50 years, for me. So my dad had four sons. I'm the youngest, Tom, and our two middle brothers that passed. But um, so I, I wrote some things down. My dad's name's Alfred, we call him Al, Big Al, if you knew him. Um, for the most part, he was over at her house every night. And uh, she made him dinner, um, and then he'd go home. So that was their um, later in, in life. And when my dad passed away, Mark was on a um, cruise. So that's my trigger. She couldn't, have been, she couldn't be there to take care of my dad because they were very close. I thought I could handle this. Serious. But my brother did say, uh, first thing out of his mouth when, when I told him the news, that Margaret made the best cobbler. <laughs> Nobody mentioned the cobbler. <laughs> but it was always there, and her best was um, strawberry and rhubarb. And um, Tom was a contractor, and um, he would take care of her house. Um, each of us brothers would have a part in taking care of her house, and whether it was mowing the lawn or my dad getting the rototiller out in the back. So I don't have the, the stories other than Margaret was always there for my dad. And so that, I'm going to say it, my, I think my trigger is gone. I think now that Margaret's passed, I can just know that they're both together again. So I, I didn't get to my list. Thank you all for coming. Hang on, I gotta suit back up here. As I mentioned, there are many different perspectives on how to view Margaret, and uh, you're hearing them. You will hear one more from someone who worked closely and uh, with Margaret and who had a large impact on her life. So I will just read verbatim and say, good afternoon. My name is Mary Walker. I am very sorry I could not be here to share in Margaret's service with you. However, I would be remiss if I did not share my story with Margaret's family and friends. My family and I will miss Margaret. Although they live in Houston, we would often reminisce about Margaret when I visited her kindness, her love for people, and our appreciation for her. Mom would frequently mention the love and respect she had for Margaret. Whenever I mentioned Margaret's name, Mom would have a smile on her face. Mom would frequently mention the love and respect because Margaret was my mentor and friend for many years, and I will always appreciate the years shared with her, and she will always have a special place in my heart. I met Margaret 
who was head nurse at the time in March of 1970. I worked as a nursing assistant on her unit. When I say she was my mentor, it is because she truly was. As a young person, she saw something in me that I did not. I was in the right place at the right time. I believe God worked a miracle when he brought Margaret and me together. God ordered my steps in my life working through Margaret. She encouraged me to go to nursing school. At the time, with my salary, I did not see a way to go to nursing school. However, I did look into it. First, I applied to Portland Community College. Because she had mentioned school to me before, I thought I'd better get a jump on her and check into it before I got the question again. After working a night shift, as I was leaving duty, Margaret approached me, gave me a chartreuse flyer from the University of Portland. They were recruiting for their nursing program. I looked at the flyer and said, this is a four-year program. No further explanation given. She just said, look into it. Being a good little trooper, I did and applied. I completed all of the necessary paperwork, etc. The irony is that the acceptance letter from PCC and University of Portland arrived to my apartment at the same time. I told this to Margaret. She said, you will go to the University of Portland. You will go to a four-year degree program. I was totally speechless. Now mind you, Margaret had a bachelor's degree and felt this is the way for me to go. As I was coming upon my senior year, Margaret asked me, are you ready to start? I said, I might need to delay this because money is difficult to come by. Margaret said, you will return. I will loan you the money. I could not believe what I was hearing. I was stunned. My eyes welled up and I thanked her and later I got a loan from First Interstate Bank. I graduated from University of Portland May 1976 with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. What a day. And on that day, Margaret hosted and catered a fantastic graduation party, a sit-down dinner. I will never forget it. It was a big party with lots of staff and guests from the Veterans Administration and, of course, great food. My mom and sister attended. They expressed much appreciation for the function. They enjoyed the party and the guests. Margaret was always an excellent cook and baker. She would bring desserts or other food dishes to work often and whenever we had potlucks. Then, in 1978-79, Margaret was not finished with me. Margaret retired as a flight nurse in the Air Force. One day she said to me, I want you to look into joining the reserves. She said, you can make some extra play money. I hesitated, however, the play money sounded good. So I did join, trained to become a flight nurse, and loved everything during my career advancements within the next 28 years of my assignments. I retired in July of 2006. Margaret retired from the VA hospital January of 1980 and I was selected to be the nurse manager on our unit. She was my advocate to the front office. We stayed in touch for many years, mostly military group meetings and lunches. There are many other stories I could tell you, but I will end here and say, God works in mysterious ways. I am where I am today as a result of God working through a beautiful person, Margaret. She encouraged me to attend nursing school, after which I obtained two more degrees and retired from two government jobs. She was a kind-hearted person, worked hard, a firm manager, expected the best from you, very professional, took care of her employees, and rewarded us 
with lots of desserts. My family and I have been blessed to know her and have her in our hearts. We will cherish our memories of Margaret for years to come. Thank you. God is good. Mary Walker, Colonel, retired. Jerry. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Jerry Villani. Uh, my mom was Margie's sister. And thank you, Tom, for uh, pulling this together. And um, although my email box was rather full at times with instructions and updates, it was appreciated. And I was very happy to work with him uh, to do what I could to uh, help him out. He's a great guy, and uh, he works hard to do his best. And I appreciate all he's done. Um, I just, I'll just make a few remarks to keep everything short. I'm sure everybody would like to say something and we have to move on to the final uh, result here. Uh, on behalf of myself, I want to thank her for uh, some logistical sh uh, support she provided me uh, after uh, several uh, international trips I made. I spent 11 years in the Navy as a journalist and even after all that, traveling around, uh, my wanderlust was not sated. Uh, after some years after leaving the Navy, I made two trips to China. Then I made a round the world trip that included uh, three months in Kathmandu, Nepal, a few weeks in Kuwait, and three months in New York City. And uh, uh, finally got homesick in New York City and made it back to Portland. And uh, uh, so I appreciate uh, her handling my mail and some other stuff, which made uh, things getting back on my feet a little bit easier. And I also want to mention that I uh, named my daughter Mary Margaret after uh, Aunt Margie uh, to continue her legacy of being uh, the type of person that she was. And uh, also on a more humorous note, she uh, knew I was a tremendous Beatles fan and she gifted me a couple of books about the Fab Four, which, which were much appreciated. And so uh, <clears throat> I do want to thank her for that. And I was going to, and that, that's about it. Uh, a lot can be said about Margie, but uh, some years ago a famous comedian said, uh, great speech is, has a start and a finish and uh, shortest time uh, between the two. So thank you again for coming here. Thank you, Tom, for pulling it all, all together. And I, uh, I'm sure everybody will remember Morgie with uh, some fond thoughts and, uh, uh, great, and the great example that she set for many people. Is there anyone else that wanted to say something in regards to Margaret? We have uh, a few minutes left, and then we will wrap up the service, and then we'll get together outside and travel separately and safely to Willamette National Ceremony for those that want to attend the burial ceremony. If not, I will turn this back over. Marsha? Great. This is so outside my comfort zone. Um, how do I know Margaret? Uh, I had the privilege of serving Margaret for the last six years as her tax lady. The first time she came into my office to prepare her tax return, she arrived with three grocery bags full of receipts. She had a lovely lady, I think her name was Eileen, that had come to her home and was helping her get her life in order. Um, as a tax preparer, that's my worst nightmare. Only thing worse is a trunk this big full of receipts. Okay, so Margaret sat at my desk, we did some visiting, and I said, now Margaret, I'm gonna have to have you go home because I'm gonna have to try to figure out what all this is. Well, in this grocery bag were receipts that painted a picture for me of the type of woman she was. I don't know why I'm crying. She was generous. 
She was kind and loving. She donated beyond belief to people, not just religious organizations and political organizations. She was generous to a fault. One day, um, her and I were having a conversation. And I said, you know, Margaret, I love that you were so generous. But let me tell you something about your political donations. <laughs> you can only write off $100, OK? So you know what I would love to see you do? I want you to give that money away, but I want you to give it to your church or to the food bank. Something that we can actually, because I'm the tax lady, get a tax benefit for. You can give a little bit of your money to those political people, but let's give it to the church and people around her. Uh, one thing I can say about Margaret, I met her when she was 89 and she's sharp as a tack. She knew what was going on. She knew what her tax return was. As a matter of fact, it was kind of funny. I sometimes wondered why she needed me. She um, came to my desk for about four years and then her health deteriorated and her finances needed to be taken care of and Tom stepped right up to the plate and took charge of her finances and I wanted to thank him for that because as a preparer, we see senior citizens being taken advantage of. And she had just enough stubbornness in her that I imagine it wasn't really very easy to get the reins away from her. So as I remember Margaret, I appreciate that she cared for her fellow human beings and she cared deeply for her country. I learned today that she was rather religious and that's not a surprise to me. So I want to say, Margaret, you deserve your rest. Rest in peace, and thank you for caring for our country and fellow human beings. <laughs> Any other speakers? We're really right on schedule, so we're doing well. But just wanted to give you a chance. Okay. Father. As many of you know, the Catholic Church has its traditions and rituals. Um, and one of them is the uh, when we come to the end of a ceremony in which we honor the person at their death is a final commendation. Our sister Margaret has fallen asleep in the risen Lord, confident in our hope of eternal life. Let us commend her to the loving mercy of our Father and let our prayers rise with her. She was adopted as God's daughter in baptism and was nourished at the table of the Lord. May she now inherit the promise of eternal life and take her place at the table of God's children in heaven. Let us also pray for ourselves that we who mourn, who miss Margaret and are saddened, may one day go forth with Margaret to meet the Lord of life when he appears in glory. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our sister Margaret in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ Jesus, she will rise with Christ on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Margaret in this life. Those blessings which we have heard about, those blessings which we know from our own experience of Margaret. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. 
Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open wide the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister Margaret forever. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there any other announcements? Tom, we'll be, uh, for those who wish to go to the ceremony at the Willamette National Cemetery, uh, there, it's not exactly a procession, but it's Foster Road to 112th, turn right, and you'll see it, it and we're at the top of the hill, I believe. It's, so the military honors will be presented there as well. So again, thank you. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me and Jerry. Thank you, and thank you for sharing parts of your life with Margaret and commending her to God.
And this concludes our ceremony. If you wish to come forward for a final leave taking, uh, that would be most appropriate. Otherwise, we will prepare to go to the uh, cemetery at this time. Thank you. <laughs>